Good morning, everyone. Welcome to ECE Colloquium. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Liang Feng from University of Pennsylvania. He's an assistant professor of material science and engineering. Uh, professor Feng uh, received his PhD degree from University of California, San Diego in 2010. Then after that, he went on to do uh, two postdocs, first at uh, Caltech, then later at uh, UC Berkeley. Afterward, he joined the faculty at the uh, University of Buffalo from uh, being an assistant professor in electrical engineering from 2014 to 2017. At that time, he moved to um, University of Pennsylvania. So Professor Fong has uh, uh, published 70 papers and received uh, many uh, awards. He's an OS Optical Society of American Fellow. He also received the National Science Foundation Early Career Award and the Army Research Office uh, Young, Investigator, uh, Young Investigator Award. Today, he's going to tell us about um, quantum-inspired photonics. Without further ado, let's give uh, Professor Fong a welcome. Uh, uh, good morning. Yeah, thank you very much for coming to the seminar. Yeah, first, I'd like to thank Professor Molly for the invitation. Yeah, it's my great honor to come here and uh, discuss our research with you. Yeah, as you can see, our research uh, is about quantum-inspired photonics. So basically here, you may have a question. Uh, when you talk about photonics, typically you talk about the classical platform, how we can merge classical platform with quantum. Uh, so but first, yeah, this is the outline. So basically, first, I will give you a very brief introduction about this you know, quantum-inspired photonics. Especially, I want to discuss in details about parity time symmetry in nanophotonics. Yeah, this can also help us uh, realize a new paradigm of using optical losses in a positive way. Yeah, after that, I will talk about our work for realizing photonics around this quantum exception point uh, basically, over here, we demonstrated the first uh, optical angular momentum micro laser a few years back. Yeah, after that, I will discuss how we can couple the non-cremission photonics with topological physics for some novel photonic effects. In the end, I will briefly summarize this seminar talk. Okay, I guess you know, most of you must be very familiar with this uh, plot. Basically, this shows us the real epsilon mu space. Okay, with exploring the photonic properties in this real epsilon mu space, we have demonstrated lots of new photonic effects and uh, new photonic functionalities, such as you know, using conventional dielectrics. People have demonstrated great photonic waveguides, yeah, two-dimensional photonic crystals. Okay, over here, you can introduce a line defect to guide the propagation of light on a chip. Okay, also, when we talk about metals, we talk about you know, plasmonic devices that can help us realize the great uh, optical field localization uh, below the conventional diffraction limit. Also, we can somehow integrate this plasmonic antenna with, plasm uh, with a silicon photonic platform to uh, demonstrate some you know, new functionality for silicon photonics. But more amazingly, by the concept of metal materials over here, yeah, people have demonstrated something that cannot be achieved with naturally available materials, such as optical magnetism. If somehow we can get both epsilon and mu smaller than zero, we talk about negative refraction and negative refractive index. Okay, however, if we want to talk about the optical engineering in a more flexible domain, we will say, okay, photonics is not really confined only in this real epsilon mu space. Something is actually missing here. What is missing? We are missing this complex dielectric permittivity plan. We are missing the gain, we are missing the loss. As a consequence, we are missing the interplay between the index, the real index, governed by this real epsilon mu space, the gain and the loss. So over here, our research is actually more on the interplay between these two different domains. We want to develop a new paradigm of strategically utilizing optical losses for novel nanophotonic functionalities. So basically over here, our approach is to use the quantum symmetry and demonstrate quantum symmetry in the classical photonic platform. Okay, now I will tell you how we can merge the classical Photonic platform with the quantum. 
OK, if you take a look at these two equations, one is a shorting equation in quantum mechanics, the other is a wave equation in photonics, we see very nice mathematical equivalence between these two different equations. OK, over here, you see in quantum mechanics, we talk about the wave function. But in photonics, this wave function phi is replaced with this electric field distribution, E, in optics. Yeah, also, in uh, shorting equation, we have time t that can be represented using the position z in the optics. Okay, similarly, the potential vx in quantum mechanics can be replaced with the refractive index in the optics. Yeah, okay. Uh, if we talk about the uh, Fourier transform of T, typically in the, uh, quantum, on the quantum mechanical side, we talk about the energy eigenvalues. Basically over here, we talk about omega. That is a pair of, uh, basically that, that uh, omega and T are a pair of Fourier transforms. So this uh, counterpart of the eigenvalues in optics would be propagation constant all the so-called wave numbers. This is a Fourier transform of position Z. So over here, we do see very nice mathematical equivalence between quantum mechanics and optics. Therefore, optics, photonics, actually provides us a very good platform to investigate all kinds of quantum symmetries, especially some symmetries that are very hard to directly implement in quantum mechanics. Okay. So over here, the symmetry we are uh, in particular interested in is parity time symmetry. But before talking about parity time symmetry, maybe we want to briefly understand what is the P symmetry, what is the T time reversal symmetry. Okay, for the parity symmetry, it's actually very simple. It's just a mirror reflection. Over here, if we have the P operator applied on the wave function along the X direction, basically this uh, X becomes minus X. So intuitively, this is what you see. Okay, over here I have a picture. I want to introduce the mirror reflection. Then along the X direction, I place my mirror. And from the mirror, I will see my picture flipped along the X direction. Okay, anyway, uh, let's move on. So if we have this P operator applied on the wave function along the Y direction, therefore plus Y becomes minus Y. So over here, I would, I, I would place my mirror along the y direction, and then from reflection, I will see my picture flipped along the y direction. Okay, so what is time reversal? Yeah, by its meaning, we know that t will become minus t. Okay, so basically, this is something we have. We have t operator applied on this wave function, then t becomes minus t. Okay, this can be very important for quantum mechanics and wave mechanics, especially you know, in quantum mechanics and wave me mechanics, we talk about this kind of harmonic oscillation. So over here, if my t goes from plus to minus, then effectively, it's like this, t this entire, entire term goes from minus i to i. Then the effective function over here, like, okay, we will have t operator, this t operator will enable i to transform from plus i to minus i. Okay, this can be important if the corresponding potential is complex. Uh, yeah, if we have imaginary part and this imaginary part is larger than zero, okay, we will see the amplification. By changing the sign of i from plus to minus, basically we're changing the sign over here, the imaginary part over here, the originally larger than zero amplification will become attenuation. Okay, as, as a consequence, the effective function for this time reversal operator is to switch amplification with attenuation and vice versa. Okay, now we can talk about the combined PT symmetric operation. Basically, we will apply the combined PT operator on something. Okay, let's say this is our Hamiltonian, yeah, simplified Hamiltonian. If we apply P or T onto this, you know, uh, kinetic energy part, basically we don't see any significant change. However, we do see some interesting change related to the potential Vx. Okay, this is what you see. Basically, if you apply the uh, parity operator, x from, goes from plus to minus, and if we apply the t operator, we introduce this 
complex conjugate to have i go from plus to minus. As a consequence, we have this star over here. Okay, if the whole system is PT symmetric, that means after this operation, the whole system will go back to the original potential, that is Vx. So clearly, over here, we know that the PT symmetric potential should look like this. Vx equals V star minus x. So this means the real part of the potential will be an even function of positions. And the imagined part of the potential will be an out function of positions. Okay, over here, why this PT symmetry is so interesting? Okay, especially, you know, we have seen a lot of research uh, along this direction in recent years. So here, let me ask you a question. Okay, typically in conventional quantum mechanics, if we want to get the real eigenvalues, we assume, okay, the corresponding Hamiltonian must be Hermitian. This means we cannot afford this imaginary part in the potential. Because once you have imaginary part in the potential, then naturally you would expect the imaginary or complex eigenvalues. But is this really true? Yeah, the answer is actually no. Okay, in 1998, Professor Calvender from Washington University, yeah, not the University of Washington, yeah, from Washington University at St. Louis actually proposed that, well, intrinsically non-Hermitian, this PT symmetric Hamiltonian can still exhibit an entirely real eigenspectrum. So what does this mean? Okay, let me try to explain this, you know, using the language in optics. Okay, let's say over here in optics, if we can create this Hermitian system with only the real index modulation, you will not expect any complex wave number, right? The wave number will be completely real because we only have the real index modulation. Okay, this is the so-called PT symmetric phase. However, if my index modulation goes from real to complex, the corresponding wave number would be complex as well, right? As you can see here, because over here, we have the contribution from the imaginary part of the index, basically the green line over here. However, this is not always true, argued by Professor Kalbender. Okay, over here, if my index modulation follows the PT symmetric definition, that means the real part is an even function of positions, and the imaginary part of the index is an odd function of positions. We will see this complex wave number only when the corresponding imaginary part index modulation, this green line, is larger than a threshold, basically this epsilon uh, denotes a threshold over here. Larger than this threshold, we will see the complex wave number, okay, corresponding to the PT broken phase. However, if my uh, imaginary part index modulation is smaller than this threshold, yeah, we will observe the real eigenvalues. Yeah, the real, only the real wave numbers, exactly the same as what we see with only the real index modulation. Okay, this, is, this phase is called PT symmetric phase. Now clearly, we can see that by changing, by controlling the imaginary part index modulation, we can realize this PT symmetric phase, trans, uh, this quantum phase transition from the PT symmetric phase, from PT symmetric phase to the PT broken phase. But then in optics, how can we realize this? The geometry can be very simple. Okay, over here, Let's just talk about a coupled waveguide system. We have two waveguides. Yeah, they couple with each other, and one waveguide is of gain, the other waveguide is of loss. Therefore, if you examine the corresponding index modulation, you will see the real part index modulation following the even function operations, and the imaginary part goes as you know, the, 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 the odd function operations, basically. Over here, you have amplification, but on the other side, you have attenuation. Okay, so if the gain loss contrast here is very small, okay, basically, this is one extreme, like, you know, over here, we just have two coupled waveguides. Okay, in this case, we will see light coupling between uh, these two waveguides. Basically, light will bounce back and forth with these two waveguides, uh, between these two waveguides, well propagation yeah, along the lengthy direction. Okay, in this case, energy gained from the gain waveguide will be dip dissipated by the loss in a lossy waveguide. As a consequence, we don't see net gain, we don't see net loss. 
yeah, it remains gain loss balanced. Okay, as a consequence, we will have no, uh, basically we will have no amplification, we will have no attenuation. Yeah, from the corresponding eigenvalues, you will see the corresponding uh, imaginary part is complete zero. We will have only the real eigenvalues. However, if the gain loss contrast is larger, uh, if the gain loss contrast is, is larger than this threshold value, this gain loss contrast plays a more dominant role in terms of the light coupling between these two waveguides. As a consequence, the corresponding coupling between these two waveguides is actually strongly reduced. Okay, in this case, we will see light more confined in the gain waveguide or more confined in the loss waveguide. In the first case, we see the strong amplification corresponding to this branch, but in the latter case, we see the strong attenuation corresponding to this branch. So in this case, we actually see a, con a pair of complex conjugate wave numbers. This is corresponding to the PT broken phase. Okay, next, if we have this PT optical modulation along the light propagation direction, we can also see very similar phase transition effects. For example, in this case, we have the real index modulation follow the causing function, and the imaginary part index modulation follow the sinusoidal function. We also introduce this delta as a coefficient for the imaginary part index modulation to control the phase transition. Okay, but here, governed by this you know, generalized power conservation law, we can see that you know, if delta is smaller than one, we talk about the conserved total energy. Okay, this is it's very similar to the Hermitian case. This is the corresponding PT symmetrical phase. Uh, if, the, if over here, if we further increase delta to increase the imaginary part index modulation, when delta is larger than one, we go into the PT broken phase where the total energy is not conserved anymore. Okay. Interestingly, at the phase transition point where delta equals one, we see the unitary transformation in both directions, but only in one direction, we see very strong reflection. And this effect what's called unidirectional invisibility. And here, I would like to notice that this PT phase, PT phase transition point is intrinsically a quantum exceptional point. And this kind of unidirectional uh, uh, reflection is just a very intrinsic nature characteristic associated with the quantum exceptional point. Okay, here, if we write down the corresponding scattering uh, matrix, similar to the Hamiltonian matrix, and uh, derive the corresponding eigenvalues, yeah, this is what we, what we have. And clearly, we see the phase transition from delta smaller than one to uh, delta larger than one. Okay, over here, when delta is smaller than one, we talk about uh, unimodular eigenvalues. But uh, when delta is larger than one, all the eigenvalues become divergent. Okay, interestingly, at delta equal to one, we see this degenerate point corresponding to the exception point. Okay, after understanding the exception point using the quantum language from the eigenvalues and the you know, scattering matrix or Hamiltonian matrix, how can we understand its effect in optics? Okay, basically, if delta is one, we have cos in x plus i sin in x, then together we end up with this exponential function. Okay, now you know that if we do the Fourier transform to this exponential function, we will introduce a unidirectional wave vector of minus q into the structure. Okay, basically this unidirectional wave vector of minus q act as a unidirectional bridge that can link only the forward instance with its reflection. If I have instant light coming from the backward direction, this unidirectional bridge will lead my backward instance to probably this point where we cannot find any corresponding point in the band structure. As a consequence, no reflection can be constructed if light is coming from the backward direction, leading to this unidirectional reflection or unidirectional reflectionless light transport. Okay. Yeah, a few years back, yeah, we demonstrated this exception point modulation in the silicon waveguide. Over here, we have uh, some sinusoidal silicon structure deposited on top of waveguide to mimic this cosine modulation, and some uh, germanium chrome structure 
they posited on top of the waveguide to mimic this sinusoidal uh, function modulation altogether. They provide this uh, unidirectional exception point modulation, and this is a corresponding uh, ICM picture of the device. And uh, in the forward direction, yes, we, we, we do see very strong reflection coming from this interface. Yeah, however, in the backward direction, the reflection cannot be constructed, and we see almost nothing reflected at this, you know, at this part. But now you may ask a question. Yeah, well, this may be a very interesting effect. Why, you know, how can we use it? How can we you know, convert this into a uh, practical application? So basically over here, I will talk about our recent work on orbital angular momentum micro laser. Okay, so yeah, when we talk about laser, this probably is the most popular diagram you will see on the internet. This is the, just the diagram for the conventional laser system. Over here, we have the game material sandwiched between two mirrors. Okay, as a consequence, yeah, these two mirrors help uh, realize a fabric pearl cavity to confine light inside the cavity, inside the game material. Okay, over here, if we pump the game material hard enough, the corresponding carriers items inside this game material will be excited, right? And then when the excited items uh, release energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. This electromagnetic radiation will be highly confined in the cavity, okay, leading to the resonant mode of the cavity. And this laser beam will come out from the mirror of the lower reflectivity. Okay, typically, if we don't do anything, we will see just you know, straight uh, propagation of the laser beam coming out of the laser cavity. And the corresponding polarization state here is also very simple polarization state, corresponding to the polarization of the rest mode inside this fabric pro cavity. Uh, but we know that in many occasions, we want to structure the state of this light into a very exotic state. Yeah, we want to get a very complicated uh, uh, structure light with unique polarization state and unique propagation along the uh, principal axis. Okay, one unique exotic light state is called uh, light carrying the angular momentum. Okay, over here, we can realize the exchange between the uh, exchange of the spin and optical angular momentum between the light and the matter. For example, over here, if my light carries the circular polarization, uh, basically the spin angular momentum, so this light can actually uh, rotate this sphere yeah, due to the exchange between the spin angular moment of the angular momentum between the incoming light and the, this absorbing sphere. However, if my incoming light is opposite angular momentum light, we will see the unique light matter interaction that can uh, rotate, basically uh, uh, rotate this, you know, this, this sphere along the orbital direction yeah, with respect to the principal axis. Yeah, also, this kind of carrier light state can help us to strongly enhance the light matter interaction with some carrier materials. But the question is, okay, when we talk about strong light matter interaction, typically we want to go to the micro nano scale. How can we create this kind of uh, laser cavity that can directly encode angular momentum in the laser light at the micro, at the micro scale. Okay, this is about our work published about three years back in science on this optical angular momentum micro laser. Okay, here to create this optical angular momentum micro laser, the cavity we pick up is a ring cavity. Why this ring cavity? Because light circulating inside this ring cavity already carries very large optical angular momentum with respect to the principal axis of this ring cavity. However, unlike a passive device we can, where we can specify the instant direction of the light, in this active device, we always have both clockwise mode and counterclockwise mode co-excited. As a consequence, we see this beautiful interference pattern forming the standing wave. It's called standing wave because it's not moving at all, right? 
Okay, as consequence, the corresponding phase information is plotted here. We see the quantized phase at either zero or pi along the azimuthal direction. What does this mean? This means the corresponding angular momentum carried by the clockwise mode and counterclockwise mode just cancel each other because they propagate in different directions. They just cancel each other. Okay, in the end, we end up with no angular momentum at all in this cavity. Okay, yeah, this sounds really bad, right? We use the ring cavity because we think it can support very good optical angular momentum, but in the end, it cannot give us any optical angular momentum. Okay, our solution is, okay, over here, we want to kill one of the modes and support only the other one. Okay, we want to support only one of these two circulating modes robustly to introduce the angular momentum again inside the ring cavity. This actually sounds very simple. Okay, if you go to any classical laser textbooks, you know, you will find this beautiful plot. If we can place an optical isolator inside, the op uh, inside this ring cavity, this optical isolator can actually help us break the time reversal symmetry and then break the carrier symmetry, enabling light circulating only in one direction, leading to the unidirectional laser operation. Okay. However, I would say this strategy may not work at the micro nanoscale because the demonstration of the micro nanoscale optical isolator by itself is a grand challenge. But what we want to do here is we want to avoid the optical isolator okay, by utilizing this unidirectional exception point modulation. We want to introduce this complex index exception point modulation into our micro ring cavity. So our micro, micro ring laser cavity is on this ingas p indium phosphide platform. We introduce this complex index modulation. Over here, this germanium uh, structure on top of the ring cavity is to introduce the real index modulation. And this chrome germanium is to introduce the imaginary part index modulation. Similar to the cosine function modulation versus the sine function modulation, we also want to control the distance between this germanium and the chrome germanium modulations you know, very carefully, precisely, such that we reach this you know, exception point modulation. The corresponding phase difference between these two sets of gratings is exactly the same as cosine versus sine. Okay, also, at the exception point, the modulation for the real part is the same as the modulation for the imaginary part. Okay, in this case, we have this unidirectional feedback. So basically, if you do the free transform, you see the same thing. You see the unidirectional uh, feedback, distributed feedback. That can help us select either the clockwise mode or the counterclockwise mode robustly. Okay, in our case, the mode we pick up is a counterclockwise mode. As you can see, in this case, from the simulation, we see light circulating only in the counterclockwise direction. So we don't have any interference the corresponding intensity is uniform along the azimuthal direction. Also in the corresponding phase plot, we see the continuous phase variation along the azimuthal directions okay, with just many cycles. The number of cycles is corresponding to the order of the Wiesling-Gary mode resonate inside this ring cavity. Okay, over here, I'm confident to say that we have created a very large optical angular momentum for the light circulating inside the ring cavity. Next is to extract the laser radiation into free space, carrying this very large optical angular momentum. Okay, to do this, we introduced a sidewalk grating, okay, over here, to scatter light upwards. Okay, but the trick is we want to make sure that the order number of this sidewalk grating is different than the order of the Wiesling Gary mode inside the ring cavity. Okay, basically something like this. Okay. If they are different, okay, basically each scatter on the sidewalk over here will see different phase for the light inside the cavity and this corresponding phase difference will be accumulated when we go around this circle. For example, the first scatter here is corresponding to optical phase at zero degree. Okay, next one, first, second scatter, 10 degrees. Third scatter, 20 degrees. 
the fourth scatter, 30 degrees, and so on and so forth. Last scatter over here will be corresponding to 350 degrees. Then over one circle, we see the continuous phase variation from zero to two pi, as what you see from this uh, numerical simulation picture. Yeah, this is corresponding to the topological charge of minus one for this vortex beam. Okay, one very important feature of this vortex laser beam is that at the center of the beam, we see the phase discontinued, uh, a phase singularity point where the corresponding phase becomes completely discontinuous over there. Okay, I will talk about the effect of this phase singularity point just in the next couple of slides. Okay, after the design, we fabricated the device using the overlay ebullitography. And as you can see, this is the ring, uh, micro ring structure with Germanic modulation and chrome Germanic modulation to provide the corresponding exception point uh, modulation. And we have all the scatters here to introduce this vortex beam laser radiation. Okay, in the, uh, uh, in the characterization, this is what we have to characterize the laser property. So basically over here, we have 1064 nano, nanometer pumping beam coming from the backside of a sample. Okay, and this objective also collects the radiation from backside and get it into the monochromator for the spectral characterization. Okay, on the front side, we have another objective to collect the laser radiation and get into this self-interference setup to characterize the corresponding OEM beam property and topological charge index of the beam. Okay. Okay, this is a corresponding spectral property of the laser action. Basically, we see uh, the evolution from the photoluminescence to single mode lasing. Yeah, this single mode lasing is, is actually uh, uh, very nice. Over here, we see the uh, sideband suppression ratio is actually larger than uh, 40 dB. And this is corresponding uh, light light curve showing the lasing threshold around this kink. Okay, but more importantly, it's, it's uh, yeah, we have to characterize the corresponding OEM property also in the far field. Because in the far field, this is what we see. You know, on the front side, we see this kind of donut shift beam profile. Okay, we have this donut beam shift beam profile because we have the phase singularity at the center of this vortex beam. Okay, because of the existence of this phase singularity, the corresponding intensity at the center needs to be uh, minimum. Uh, you know, in the ideal case, it should be zero. Okay, now we want to get this donut into the self-interference setup. Okay, the first beam splitter over here will split the donut into two. One goes upwards, the other goes downwards, and second beam splitter over here will recombine these two donuts for the interference. And we have the delay line over here to make sure that they overlap with, with each other in time. Okay, over here, when we do the interference measurements, we have a you know, very uh, special trick. We don't want to overlap these two donuts completely. We want to create a horizontal offset between these two donuts. As a consequence, the helical wavefront at the center of the donut will see the quasi-planar wavefront at the outer area of the donut. Yeah, so unlike the, the interference of two planar wavefronts, we will see some interesting uh, fringes, like these two forks. Okay, over here you can see we have two forks corresponding to two centers of these two donuts, respectively. Okay, at each fork, we have the fringe split from one fringe into two. Okay, meaning that the corresponding topological charge index over here is one or minus one, yeah, depending on definition. In our case, it's minus one. Okay, more interestingly, over here with this ring cavity, due to the rotational symmetry, we can get some more exotic polarization state than just X or Y. Okay, in this case, the resonant mode in our micro laser is called a TM mode. So for this mode, we have two polarization components. One is a radio polarization component where you see the corresponding electric field extends outside the sidewall. Okay, the other is the azimuthal polarization component. In this case, the corresponding electric field is more confined on top of the bottom of this in-gas P layer. 
So clearly, this radio partition component is more sensitive to the introduced sidewall grating. As a consequence, our sidewall grating can only efficiently extract this radio partition component for radiation, leading to the radially polarized OMB. Okay. So here, this is a corresponding experimental verification of the radio polarization for our OM laser, uh, uh, laser beam. Okay, the, uh, the, this experiment is actually very simple. What we want to do is we just want to collimate the laser beam and have the laser beam pass through a linear polarizer. Okay, as a consequence, we see the uh, transformation from full donut to this kind of too low pattern. Okay, we see very strong intensity in, you know, in this direction because only in this direction, the corresponding polarization is aligned with this linear polarizer. Then by changing the direction of the linear polarizer, we see the rotation of this too low pattern as well, meaning that the corresponding polarization of our OEM laser radiation is radio polarization. Here, I'd like to say that this radially polarized OM beam is actually kind of important because this is the polarization state that can be supported by the OM fibers. The conventional X and Y polarization state OM beam cannot be supported by the OM, uh, by the you know, popular OM fibers. Therefore, you know, our uh, result, with our micro laser, may be directly coupled with the OM, OM, fib, uh, OM fiber for fiber optics communications. Okay, next I, will, I would like to switch the gear a little bit to talk about the coupling between non-Hermitian photonics and topological physics. I think probably most of you, you know that one very important quantum-inspired field in photonics is actually topological photonics, uh, applying topological physics for some novel photonic functionalities. So over here, we are intrinsically distinct. We would like to see if we can couple non-Hermitian uh, photonics with topological physics to achieve some interesting effects. Okay, the most classical topological physics model is the so-called Su uh, schrieffer heger model, because it's the so-called SSH model. So in this model, we have a lattice. But in this lattice, we have the alternating weak and strong couplings like this. This is strong coupling, this is weak coupling. We have this alternating weak strong couplings to enable the non-trivial topological property. Okay, however, on the second half, the right half, if we switch the sequence of the weak and strong couplings, we will also switch the corresponding topological phase. Okay, as a consequence, the topological interface can emerge between these two different halves of different topological properties. Okay, this topological interface can support a robust topologically protected interface state as well. Okay, if we want to pick up this topological uh, interface state for the uh, laser uh, for the laser action, yeah, we can also introduce another alternating non-Hermitian gain loss modulation like this over here. We have gain loss, gain loss. This alternating gain loss uh, modulation across the entire interface to select this topological interface state for the robust laser action. Okay, in, in this case, we see that the corresponding topological interface state uh, can reach the laser threshold, but all other box states, all other box states cannot reach the laser threshold. Yeah, suffer, suffer you know, from significant loss and will get sp spoiled by the introduced non-Hermitian gain loss modulation. Here, I, I would also like to emphasize that the energy of this topological interface state is exactly pinned at the center of the band gap. This is also why this state is called topological zero mode. Okay, so basically in this case, only this topological uh, zero mode can reach the leading threshold, and this is the corresponding uh, mode profile of this topological zero mode, where we will only see strong intensity at every other uh, site. Okay. Okay, in experiments, we implemented this topological model in the INGASP Indian Phosphite platform for the laser action. And over here, you can see we have coupled, coupled micro rings 
to mimic this SSH model, and we also introduced this non-Hermitian gain loss modulation by depositing chrome uh, in you know, this ring, this ring, and this ring. Okay. In the end, yeah, we do see very nice single mode laser action, very robust single mode laser action corresponding to the topological zero mode. Yeah, from the far field emission picture, yeah, we do see that you know, uh, only you know, every other macro ring lights up, okay, uh, leading to the, uh, de delivering the, the, the laser radiations. Okay, in addition, we also did a control experiment. Yeah, over here, yeah, all, uh, in this case, we only have this topological, we only have this topological model, but without any non-Hermitian gain loss modulations. Okay, in addition to this topological zero mode lasing, all other modes, box states, can also reach the lasing threshold, leading to the multi-mode lasing. Okay, as a consequence, also from the far field laser emission picture, we see the uh, rather uniform laser radiation compared to this, you know, uh, 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 topological zero mode. Okay, here, you know, beyond this, beyond this, you know, robust selection of the topological zero mode, we ask ourselves another question. Can we somehow use non-hermitian photonics to create a topological state at a location where we may not expect the existence of any topological state? Okay, this is another work on this non-hermitian topological photonics lattice. So in this case, we still have this SSH model, but different than the SSH model in the previous work. Over here, we have just uniform topological property across the entire lattice. We don't need to change the weak and the sequence of the weak and strong couplings in the second half of this lattice. Okay, this, this entire lattice is of the same topological property. Therefore, we cannot expect, simply expect, the corresponding topological interface state over here. Why? Because there is no topological interface. Okay, but instead, we introduced different gain loss contrast uh, on the left side and the right side. Okay, so over here, we introduce more gain loss contrast, and this side, we introduce less gain loss contrast. As a consequence, we realized a uh, non-Hermitian phase transition in space from the PT symmetrical phase to the PT broken phase from right to left. Okay, okay uh, in the experiments, basically we designed this you know, uh, one-dimensional waveguide lattice to mimic this SSH model. So over here, each waveguide is corresponding to each side in this SSH model. The corresponding couplings, the weak and strong couplings, can be precisely controlled by the distances between two adjacent waveguides. If the distance is smaller, we talk about strong coupling. If the distance is larger, we talk about the weak coupling. And the corresponding gain loss contrast on both sides are controlled by the deposition of these you know, chrome, uh, uh, this, you know, chrome on top of the waveguides. As consequence, you can see over here we have a stronger gain loss contrast, but here we have a much weaker gain loss contrast. Altogether, we realize this non-hermitian phase transition in this topological lattice. Yeah, uh, as shown by this, uh, this simulation picture, we can clearly see the re-emergence of one interface state over here. Yeah. But if this interface state is a topological symmetry protected topological zero mode, we will see. Okay, in the experiment, we fabricated this non-hermitian photonic lattice in the uh, silicon platform. Okay, to excite the topological interface state, we have, uh, we will deliver lights through this waveguide directly, couple, uh, directly connected with the center, uh, with the, 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 the interface waveguide of this, uh, of this photonic lattice. Also, we introduced, uh, a periodic nano holes on top of the photonic lattice to efficiently scatter the guided light into free space for the direct visualization in the far field. Okay, in experiment, we want to verify whether or not this interface state is a symmetry protected topological zero mode. Okay, to do this, first, we need to see the corresponding eigenenergy. 
Okay, to see the eigen energy, we want to know the corresponding groove velocity, the corresponding phase velocity, okay, of the, of the state. So basically we want to get the corresponding uh, uh, dynamic uh, measurement for the interface state. Also, we want to compare our dynamic measurement results with a single uh, unperturbed waveguide that represents the, the uh, corresponding zero energy. Okay, so in this case, we built a, a heterodyne setup to achieve the temporal measurements for the wave packets propagating inside the interface state and single uh, unperturbed waveguide. So uh, over here, yeah, the upper panel shows the results at different time delays uh, for uh, the wave packet traveling inside this you know, interface state and the bottom panel shows the result associated with the single waveguide. Okay, if you compare these two results, we can clearly see they are, we see very nice consistency between them in terms of the pulse duration, the pulse shape, and also the dispersion of the wave packet. Okay, but another beauty of this experiment is that we can quantitatively evaluate the corresponding group velocity and the phase velocity. So in this case, by switch, sweeping the, the delay line in the uh, hydrodynamic setup, we can uh, actually trace the center, the traveling of the center of the wave packet in time for both, for both the interface state and the single uh, waveguide. Okay, this is the corresponding result. Okay, as you can see, uh, the corresponding uh, the, the, the corresponding uh, refractive index, effective index, phase velocity, and group velocity for these two cases are almost the same. So basically over here, we have the same uh, effective index for both cases, meaning that okay, the corresponding interface state is a symmetry protected zero mode. Okay, so in this case, well, we don't have uh, the topological interface, but still we can recreate this topological zero mode in a lattice of the uniform uh, topological property. Okay, in the, uh, about two years back, the Nature Photonics organized a special issue to highlight this emerging field on non-chromation photonics. Okay, we were actually invited to write a review article uh, to, uh, to, to, to deliver a summary on this non emission photonics based on parity time symmetry. Here, I would like to use just two sentences in this review article to wrap up my talk. So basically, over here, we can see the research in this field of non emission photonics can not only deepen our understanding in the fundamental science, in the fundamental science, basically fundamental physics, but also facilitate technological breakthroughs for photonic applications. We believe that this, the relevant research can advance and benefit both fields simultaneously. Okay, in the end, I would like to acknowledge all my students. Basically, they are the actual driving force behind all these works. I'm just uh, taking the advantage, the traveling around, to talk about their results. Uh, also, you know, thank you for your attention. Okay, we have time for questions. So I have one. So um, the, the topological lasers are PT symmetric lasers. It seems you have to artificially introduce loss to sort of facilitate the one type of mode. Yep. So uh, does that compromise the energy efficiency in terms of uh, pumping and the conversion, uh, you know, outputting the power? Just compared to uh, just a uh, you know, traditional laser with all, only one type of gain medium. Okay, typically, you know, when you talk about this kind of laser array, you talk about, you know, couple of super modes. As a consequence, if you don't do any trick, you know, all the modes can reach the lasing threshold. Yeah, actually, in this case, you will have a much stronger mode competition. Yeah, if you, yeah, the, 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 the total power coming out of, you know, this case may be stronger, but the interested, the, but the lasing power coming from the interested mode is actually weaker, as you can see in this case, if you compare. They, actually, they were actually pumped at the, you know, with the same pumping uh, intensity. 
Right, but because you have a multi-mode uh, laser system, right? If you yeah. if you suppress, you were able to suppress other modes, right? Would you? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, over here, what we do is we suppress other modes also to reduce the corresponding uh, what's it called mode computation. Yeah, for the limited gain. Any other questions? If not, then let's thank the speaker again.